coming up at South Carolina, we still got a coaching search going on at South Carolina. Now, the very latest, things change. Things change a lot. That's why we continue to touch on this every single show. When we last spoke together, I was talking to you about, and then you were kind of talking back to me in the chat and DMs, about how you felt about Shane Beamer. Shane Beamer is current tight ends coach out at Oklahoma, and he's got strong ties to the program, got a lot of folks around the program that have been lobbying for him, very supportive of him, former players, yada, yada. We touched on that the other night. And it was thought and widely reported that he was the leader in the clubhouse for this job. Now, the other night I told you I wasn't 100% sold on that sentiment. Uh, he very well may have been perceived as the leader, but I also told you I thought Billy Napier could change that with one phone call. And I still believe that. Now, the only difference is I think the public sentiment around this coaching search has sort of shifted more towards what I was talking about the other night. And I have followed it, obviously, day by day. I've talked to a lot of folks I know, listened to a lot of folks who are very close to the South Carolina beat. I think the guys over at the Big Spur have continued to do just blowout coverage of this. I mean, every whisper, every time someone changes their parking spot, there is either an update from Tony over there, John Whittle, or, or Sherbert. So, I mean, they got it all covered from every angle. You may not like what you hear sometimes, but it's really good information over there. Now, I've heard largely what they've heard today. There have been updates they've posted over on the Big Spur throughout the day. Billy Napier was never out of this. Uh, this was never close to done. As far as I was concerned, it was never close to done. But here's what has been reported today. And again, I, I've talked to folks, uh, maybe that they've spoken with, maybe that they haven't spoken with, who back up all this. And by all this, I mean Billy Napier's inter inter second interview for this job, first in-person interview for this job, is going to come Saturday. Now, they play App State Friday night. So he will be free on Saturday. He's also passed COVID. You know, there was that little pesky detail that, well, he had COVID and he was in quarantine. So those in-person interviews, kind of hard to do when you can't be within a certain radius of any human beings. They know what he wants. He's told them what he needs. And let me revisit a couple of the misnomers out there that I saw just kind of floated around. Sometimes when you hear that South Carolina can't meet so-and-so's demands, what you automatically think is they want to get themselves this much money and then the school, in this case, South Carolina, is balking at that. And what that translates to a lot of times is uh, he wants to be paid this and they want to pay him that. Sometimes that's the case. Other times that's not the case. More oftentimes, and I think what the situation here is, is he's wanting a total resource pool which extends well beyond just how much money is going into his pocket that maybe hasn't been signed off on yet. And that may mean everything from certain very, very specific facility updates that he wants. And I'm very speculative on that. That's not anything I've heard. But it could be, as an example, that it could be that he wants a certain level of support staff. Maybe he wants 13 guys here and they'll only agree to eight. It's those sorts of very, very fine detail-oriented points that if you can't get them all signed off on, Maybe you're willing to bend, maybe you're not. Maybe you want a certain guarantee for your assistant coaches. Maybe you want this much money for your defensive coordinator, and they'll only give you that much money. It's that sort of deal. And so there has been no agreement or there's been no slamming of the door anyway. That is what negotiation is all about. Maybe you get yourself in a fortuitous enough position where you can do it in your professional life one day. Well, you only get a few of them even in this profession. I know this is bigger money in all likelihood than you and I get to talk about, but you're still only getting to be in that arena a few times. And like I said the other night, remember what you're going to ask the head coach of South Carolina to do. You're going to hopefully ask him to get you in competition with Georgia or Florida. Maybe not year in, year out, but be competitive. And then every couple of years, we want to be able to strike. And so ask yourself, what kind of resources do you need to do that? When's the last time Kirby Smart got told no on a resource request? When was the last time Dan Mullen got told, no, nah, we don't, we're not really that into it here. Jeremy Pruitt getting told that? No, he's not. And so you're already viewed as being at a somewhat historical disadvantage to those teams. If you're a competitor, you don't care about history, like I said. But if you're a competitor, you're also smart enough to understand, hopefully, I got to have all my yeses. I got to have all my boxes checked. Or else I'm going to come in here and I'm going to go 500 and look you in the eye and say, what did you expect? You know, that's why I don't think anyone should ever be fired from Vanderbilt. You can look at the zero win column all you want to. I can look at the fact that there are high schools in Texas that have better facilities than they do. And yet you're asking them, hey, uh, got Georgia coming in here Saturday. Like, go get them. And uh, you got Florida a couple of weeks. Tennessee's going to come in here. Got South Carolina later. You know, they dwarf you in resource, but 
just get some wins anyway. That's ridiculous. Now, we're talking about night and day difference between Carolina and Vanderbilt, but the point is, if I'm a head coach and I'm in demand, a lot of folks value me, I'm going to get yes to every box, or especially if I'm comfortable where I'm at, or I'm not dying to crawl over broken glass to leave. Now, I want to ask this as well, because I've talked to some people, and there's a feeling out there that, oh, we shouldn't pay that much. You know, the hypothetical figures that are being floated out there about what it would take to get Billy Napier to South Carolina. Oh, we can't, we can't go that far. Well, let me ask you something. Where did this sudden fiscal hesitancy come from in Columbia? And I want you to bear in mind what you just committed to, to buy out a coach. You're about to pay a guy darn near a quarter million dollars a month for the next four years to not coach your team. That's Will Muschamp. What is an added couple of million dollars a year at this point? Like, that's what I'm not grasping. And I also want you to understand this. As I told you, I was watching Moneyball the other night, the Oakland A's story. Uh, friends, that's baseball. No one's moneyballing their way to an SEC championship. No one is cutting corners financially and still getting to Atlanta. You can't do it. This is a different world. College football is a different world. To compete at any kind of elite status, you got to pay elite level money. That's just what it's going to be. And if you find yourself having thinking you've struck a deal on the front end, I want to ask you this. Don't think about 2020 or 2021. Think about 2023. I tried to pose this the other night in, in pure hypothetical terms. You know, if it's 2023, okay? The guy you hired's had a couple of years to try and overturn the roster. He's got his thumbprint on the program. It reflects his identity at that point. And it's mid fourth quarter and you're playing Georgia, and it's 24 to 23, and you're within one, and you're driving, trying to get in field goal range to hopefully kick a game winner as time expires with a trip to Atlanta on the line. If that is the case, it means you've hired the right guy. And if you've hired the right guy, is anyone sitting around in that stadium with two minutes, 20 seconds left, two minutes left, 145, 44, 43? You know, George, I know we're about to win this thing or be in really good position too, but man, we overpaid for this guy tell you that that extra three million dollars a year that that this coaching staff's costing us I mean I know we're gonna beat Georgia here but is it really worth it uh the next time someone has that conversation will be the first time someone ever has that conversation if he's the guy if he is the best for South Carolina pay him what he wants give him what he needs resource wise and then get out of the way and let him run the program so I mean the, the Shane Beamer talk is every bit as much there now as it was 48 hours ago I just, I really wonder how this thing's going to go this weekend with the Napier in-person interview. Because, um, you know, I get the perception that Shane Beamer knows how this game works. The game, I mean the hiring game, the, the coaching search game. I'm not knocking him. He's doing what I would do. I get in touch with every contact I have. I get in touch with every person at that university, every former player I have any kind of relationship with, and I grease every wheel I possibly can. Ed Orgeron did it to ultimately get himself hired at LSU. You could easily play your way into landing an SEC or a Power 5 head coaching job by doing that, and that's independent of whether he's qualified or not. I am making no judgment on that. I'm not qualified to make that judgment. Here's what I do think I know, though. I don't know how good Napier is in an interview setting. Like, I don't know how many knee-slapping anecdotal laughs he'll draw out of you. I think he knows how to win. And I think he knows how to build a program. And it's my humble opinion here in Nashville, Tennessee, removed from the situation, that he probably gives you the best chance to win long term. So that's what I'm pulling for to see. And having said that, I obviously have really no interest other than just a curious observer.